So special. welcome, welcome. Um, I've been excited about this panel. All right, so we're talking about the athletes' competitive edge. And I'm going to kind of go through each of you, and then we'll, we'll kind of roundtable some things. Um, Paul, I want to start with you. We've spent a lot of time with you at Bloomberg. And starting a new sports league, I think in the words you said to us, it's a heavy lift. But it's incredible you had Alibaba Josai backing you. Um, it's pretty incredible. You co-founded it with your brother, Mike. Heavy lift. Why'd you do it? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Heavy lift. I, I wasn't as creative in my response as, as I uh, maybe would have hoped to have been. But heavy lift, we could probably all identify with is, is what we do, starting at least on the field and on the court in the weight room. Uh, so that... I think work ethic translates into what a lot of athletes do in the boardroom. And for me, different than my peers here, I have been playing for the lion's share of my athletic career, a sport that is outside of the core four sports that are consumed in the marketplace. And it was my passion, just like their respective sports are theirs. And when you get an opportunity to be one of the best at it, at whatever it is that you do, and you continue to move from high school to college, and then in my case, pro, uh, it became very apparent that uh, the professional opportunity in lacrosse wasn't there, yet it could have been, based on, I think, what we're gonna talk about in the subject matter today, which is the advent of new technology, new media, uh, relative startup costs going down, opportunity then going up, uh, and, and educational, um, uh, kind of swing in amongst athletes and, and the opportunity to then uh, leverage platform and, and do something that is intellectually stimulating that can impact the economy and impact a, your subset of, of colleagues. And in my case, it was, hey, uh, not only do I want to do something that I think our sport deserves in lacrosse and leverage all those modern tools to get there, but it can materially impact the, the professional career of my peers um, it was a heavy lift because starting a league from scratch is, is almost unimaginable. There are so many nuances from, you know, legal to marketing to fundraising to, to brand building to player contracts to venue negotiations to sponsorship agreements that all have to be in place for it to start. And the last thing I'll say is different than, you know, building a SaaS company or any other product or service from the ground up, you can delay your launch until you're perfectly set to go to market. In a sports league, we had to negotiate all those venues, build our player contracts, have our media rights deal with NBC, and start on June 1st, 2019. So right. there was no delaying of that. So you, we were literally, our feet weren't against the fire, we were in the fire building this thing. Right, you gotta commit and go. Jay, I want to bring you in. Speaking of um, the, um, heavy lifts, Jason, New York Times a few years ago, and I, if you guys could quiet down, because I want to I want to read this. Jason, you are high school All-American, National Player of the Year, National Champion at Duke, number two overall in the NBA draft selection. It all came to an end in June of 2003. You had a motorcycle accident. It put you in intensive care for five weeks, you watched on TV as your team, the Chicago Bulls, they drafted your replacement. You were on your back for months at a time. You didn't even know if you were gonna walk again. I mean, this was unbelievable. Your leg held together by 100 staples, various metal, metal contraptions. Your comeback took years, and yet you did. You've reinvented yourself. You're having your second act. You're an ESPN analyst. You're a co-founder in a company. Um, tell us about what you learned as an athlete that helped you get through all this and get here. Yeah. Um, well, Congratulations. First off, thank you. I hope that I can have a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth act. Yeah. Um, I think by the current events that we've all experienced this past week, I think we all have a, there's a level of appreciation that comes with the opportunity that we're provided. And I think for me personally, uh, we talk about risk mitigation with a lot of things you do when you're young and you're giving a lot of money and the thing that makes athletes great is their competitive edge 
for me, I came from an environment in which we were very team oriented, but the team I got drafted to was a bad team. So you had a lot of individuals on a bad team and I had never been through that experience because um, I was used to being collective um, as a unit. And that led me to riding a motorcycle and that led me to being in hospital. But I, I think the way I was able to reinvent, and I think you see a lot of companies that are able to do this as well, is when you start owning your story. I think for a long time I tried to stiff arm my story and try to make it not a part of who I was. But as I have a scar that runs from my ankle all the way up to my high thigh, uh, for the first you know, year of my life I would always complain about a scar until I realized that I still have my damn leg. And having my leg is something to be appreciative about. And then I started hearing other people's stories about whether you're starting a franchise or whether you're starting a league or whether you have a data company, whatever it might be, the startup process of it. And I recognize that there are troubles that we all go through in that startup process of whatever industry that you're currently in. So I realized that other people had accidents in other forms or fashions of their life. And I was like, well, I think a way I can connect myself to other people is talk openly about my accident, about what I learned through my experiences, about how I tried to reinvent myself. And that made the connectivity so much easier for me to relate and people to relate to me about my story. And I think by doing that, I started to build out my personal board about people that I think held themselves to higher standards in different verticals, business, being a dad now, uh, right. being a husband. And I started surrounding myself with people that I thought could help me get to the aspirational places that I want to be. I want to bring in Najee. Um, you're balancing both kind of your first and second act. You're still playing. Paul's still playing. Um, but what's it like to balance that with creating a company and trying to build that out as well? And talk to us a little bit about VPO. Um, yeah, so VPO is a monetization technology. We monetize any digital software and through pictures and video. And for me personally, um, balancing the two has not been that difficult because of the behavior that we perform in the company and what I do on the football field. Um, similar to what we are able to provide for the fans for a better fan experience is the same thing that I see every day. Um, and that is reluctant to trust, teamwork, and leadership. And in those three entities with trust, just like in our business, you know, you have trust in your teammates, you have teamwork and the cohesion on the football field, and you have leadership. And with us working with existing content, optimizing the fan experience by allowing fans to directly connect to better stories, you know, we are able to do those things seamlessly. And I'm able to perform at a high level every Sunday that I get to approach the game, and it's allowed me to still play and build this company as well as actually, you know, prepare every day on the football field. Um, and Ovi, I want to bring you in too because you played for the Ravens, you're all pro with the Falcons, you met Ted Turner and his daughter and kind of your world changed and sustainability through a couple of different steps became really important to you. Absolutely. I'm um, truly honored to really check, 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 check. All right. Gotcha. So I'll say I was truly honored when I got to the Falcons, I was... Um, you know, I was blessed to be the, the highest paid fullback in NFL history at the time. And that was something that stuck with me and people kind of knew me for that. But I, I didn't want to just be the highest paid. I wanted to be the best and I wanted to be the most influential with that platform. And one of the things that um, uh, occurred around a similar time where I got a chance to meet Ted Turner and his daughter was that our kids were, me and my wife's kids were born so really premature. Um, they couldn't leave the NICU, couldn't leave the hospital until the air quality in Atlanta got, got better. And I wasn't big on air quality or pollution or environment or sustainability. It just wasn't my thing. But when it affects your kids, when it has a chance to, you know, take out the people that you love the most, it, it makes you as a father realize that you got to do more than just play ball, you know, live life and keep it moving. So I started my foundation where we, you know, educate and inspire the next generation of environmental leaders. We do, uh, we have a comic book called Gridiron Green where we use the sustainable development goals that United Nations and UNICEF have created as a part of our uh, curriculum. We also have a green tailgate initiative where we teach sports fans, if you're gonna tailgate, do so in an environmentally responsible way. We also have a speaker series where we teach um, communities of color about green jobs. Because the crazy thing is that communities of color are disproportionately affected by the environmental, by climate crisis, but they're, they don't have the opportunity to, be, to take part in the green economy. So sports is that wonderful connector that has the ability to tell a story, to resonate with people, and to really, you know, give people the opportunity to make green by going green. And it's something that we've been excited to do at my foundation and something we're gonna keep on doing. 
You know, what I'd love to do is throw it out to all of you, is what is it about what you've learned, either playing the game, um, playing on the field, what is it the traits that you got in doing that that have really made a difference in going out on your own, starting a business, or creating a new league? What is it that you see that kind of maybe makes you different from other business people? What is it that maybe gives you the advantage? I'm curious, Ovi, let's start with you. I mean, well, well what it is is that, you know, I'm a fullback. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what fullbacks is, <laughs> or, but fullbacks, we block for our running backs and our, and our quarterbacks. And uh, I've lived my whole life, or the majority of my football life, as always, you know, in the background. That's fine. We're, we're blue collar workers. Like, if I challenge the audience to name like five fullbacks, I guarantee you, 99% <laughs> of you guys couldn't even name five fullbacks. And so we're, we're more of, you know, the, the glue that holds the team together. Yeah. And being able to be comfortable in your position, to know your role, that's something that has really allowed me in my business uh, career. I, my, my dad is a, um, a, a physician, my parents are Nigerian immigrants, and they really instilled in us uh, that work ethic. Uh, my dad was like either doctor, lawyer, engineer, all immigrant families, doctor, lawyer, engineer. Football wasn't even his thing. He, he wasn't too excited about football. <laughs> he's okay now though. He's okay now, he's, he's good now, but it, that, that work ethic that he taught me and understanding how to play your role has right. helped me in my medical sales business and the work of my foundation. Paul, any thoughts? Or any of you, please. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a great question that we think about as athletes pretty regularly. And I would say that it's highly bespoke to any individual in any industry. Uh, I, would, I would venture to guess that pro athletes, by and large, the, the, the bulk of them have an incredible work ethic to what you had said, and, and the ability to go to hell and back and that mindset that's cultivated at an early age, enduring physical pain and a lot of mental pain, uh, is unique to sport. But there are plenty of executives and young analysts in all industries that have incredible competitive spirit and work ethic too. So it's not exclusive to athletes, that's just one trait. What I found though is shared amongst a lot of other athletes that I've uh, seen crossover in the business world, sometimes while playing, and then in many cases when they're done, is the ability to critically think. So they're critical thinkers. Uh, the translation starts in practice. So the best athletes in the world, they understand at an early age that team practice is only the starting block. And what they do is they go to the backyard, they play basketball, they imagine 10 other people on the court they're creative and they're thinking critically about ways that they can build their skill so that they can outcompete their competitors. And that skill translate and translated for me in business is to be able to take everything that's in front of me, not accept anything at face value, ask questions, think critically around ways that we can innovate or improve that process and then apply it immediately. And I think that's the last thing before I'll, before I'll pass it over to Jay is, is the, the ability to move very fast, come up with an idea and implement it is part of what we do in sports on a weekly basis. We play a game every week, we assess whether we win or lose, we look at the updated scatter report and we change. And in business, especially with very mature companies, that changing cycle is sometimes six to 18 months. In sports, it's every week. And that's why a lot of athletes get into the startup space because they're used to that velocity. Yeah, I would say I think um, being an athlete, you're very solutions oriented. And being an athlete doesn't always translate to business all the time. You know, I was right. only an athlete in the NBA for one year. I've been more on the corporate side than I have on the athlete side. Right. I mean, my first four or five years at ESPN, I made $35,000, all right? So I think the ability to communicate from being a point guard was something that was critical because just like Paul alluded to, you have to be able to communicate in real time to people, understanding what their personality traits are, to get them to buy into something bigger than themselves in order for the ultimate goal for the team, which is to win. You know, we do a show uh, with Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman called The Boardroom that we license back to ESPN. And it's been amazing to sit down with all these individual athletes to understand how they go about themselves as a business. I think today the landscape has changed drastically. First off, the money has changed. Right. I'll be curious to see what the highest fullback gets paid in today's game as, a pair, as opposed to what you got paid. But I think now, even from a risk mitigation perspective, 
I mean, you're thinking about yourself as a business. It actually led me to become a partner in an insurance company with Epic Insurance because now you're looking at all the different verticals of your business, from yourself as a brand to the cyberspace. You know, it's happening around this weekend. Right. You know, even from the investment fraud space, you have to look at all the different aspects of yourself because now you are an international brand that can parlay into equity stakes in companies, that can parlay into brand endorsement deals, or into creating your own brand itself. Wait, I was, was going to ask, oh. I've got this incredible panel up here, and it's really hard to hear. So could I just ask you to just simmer down a little bit? Thank you. All for you now. To go. <laughs> yeah, I would like to add that um, one of the things that's been unique in my career, playing middle linebacker, um, you the signal caller, we get to speak directly to the heads of everyone that involves the game. And in business, uh, something that we do uniquely with VPO is that we get to speak to all of the sides of business from the front office perspective to the football side to the fan side and provide the best fan experience at the optimal time at the peak moment of interest. And being a great leader and being a middle linebacker of the defense, playing on defenses and, you know, and thinking about what goes on in the game, as a teammate and as a leader, you enter this flow during a game, just like you do in business. You enter this flow of ecstasis where you have to be a cohesive machine. Right. And in football, there's 11 parts. And, you know, in lacrosse and basketball, there's five. And then, you know, you understand that being a fullback, there's you, each, each person has a specific job to do on each play to optimize the output of it. And when you do that job the right way, there's always something that you continue to tweak and you continue to change and you continue to do better as you progress through each entire play. And it's similar to the cycles in business. As you go through business and as we extend ourselves and as you look at content for us specifically, we like to find out different peak moments of interest. And in my circumstances standpoint, I actually get to see those while we're still playing. While you, you know, you get to identify the offense, you get to see what fans, you get to see what vendors, you get to see what owners and front office people like to identify with. And they enter that flow of ecstasis. And if you're able to pull them into that and capitalize on it, that's what makes your business better. Go ahead. I'll have one, one more thing to add to a great question, which is in pro sports, the reason why we're all here the business of sports has enhanced. It's so dynamic, right? There's gaming, there's esports, there's a corporate sponsorship model that's evolved, media rights has taken over, dynamic ticketing pricing. And so it's gotten very attractive and why we have so many sophisticated business people entering sports. But think about players as this, whether it's a five year, 10 year or 20 year career, you're an understudy to that business. We have exposure every day to the ownership groups, to the GMs, to the team presidents, and a lot of athletes are very aware and smart about that, and they're listening. So whether they realize it at an early age or when they start becoming a veteran, they're like, oh, I, I, I get it now. And so put it this way, at, at the core sport level, these athletes have exposure to multi-billion dollar businesses and how these businesses are functioning. So having, oh no, no, go ahead. I was going to say one thing that I think uh, we all kind of touched on that's extremely important, especially in the business world, is just that level of teamwork that's necessary. Because as we've all played our roles, we have to be able to know when to give, when to get, when to add a little more and play the role as a team. When um, I got out of the NFL and entered the business space, and even on the philanthropic side, it, it was something that came natural to me. Um, and finding solutions as well, extremely important. When it comes to the climate crisis, big problem, needs a big solution. And I've been you know, blessed to talk to the NAACP environmental justice program, talking to Green Sports Alliance, Keep America Beautiful, and we're all we'll get our heads together with uh, Nomepa and other great partners and try to figure out what can be that key to spread the word. And it's great that sports keeps on coming back over and over again to get athletes who have the influence, the platform, to share something that can truly make a difference. Well, this is great because Jason and I talked about this a little bit earlier, and I think we've, you know, you athletes in terms of controlling your brand, right? And think about the reach that you have, whether it's through social media and how you can quickly go right to your fan base. Yeah. What's, so many questions. What's your responsibility, whether it's Hong Kong protests or some other injustices that are going on? Because you're seeing a lot of tensions between team owners, between leagues, and between players. Tell me about that balance and how tricky so, it is. Oh, well, I think that also depends upon the latitude of your employer. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you have yeah, to understand, yeah. prime example. Well, do the leagues have a lot of latitude? 
As your employer? Uh, yeah, or the team I mean, owners? You, but I mean, for every action, there's a reaction. There are repercussions for what you decide to stand for, i.e. Kyle or Kaepernick. I understand that's a bigger issue that we can tap into. Uh, but I have the same issue all the time with ESPN, obviously. Um, look, ESPN is owned. It's a parent company is Disney, obviously, with Bob Iger. And you have to understand for certain things, if you tread upon certain things that the company mandates that they don't want you to tap into, there will be repercussions for that. So I, I think there is a responsibility to a degree, but you have to understand what the sacrifices are. And I think that's a huge statement for a lot of younger athletes, because I, look, we just, the platform is there. We can talk about anything that we want, whenever we want to talk about that. That's a gift. But with that gift comes responsibility to understand there are repercussions if you decide to go against the grain of what your employer deems not important, no? Well, I want you guys to go away, because I do wonder now that you run businesses, do you understand that other side? Yeah, so on the, on the business side of the house, what's been really interesting is we've seen this startup economy proliferate, call it like the shark, the shark tank era. Uh, the cost to start a business has never been better, and founders are equity rich and cash poor. Their business goals are to acquire customers. The best way to acquire a customer is to go direct to that customer, not out of home in your marketing. Flip side, you have athletes who for a long time have been cash rich and equity poor. So there's a natural match. Then with the evolution of social media, athletes now can go for the first time direct to consumer. Athletes haven't become all of a sudden these celebrities that didn't have the same pop 30, 40, 50 years ago. Think Joe Namath, think Muhammad Ali, think Michael Jordan. What we have now is social and we have that access to our audience whenever we want. It's not when linear media affords us that opportunity. So if you take the two trends and you marry them, that's why a lot of athletes now are working with founders of startups and a lot of founders of startups are looking to touch athletes because of that direct to consumer, the work ethic, the critical thinking, the creativity, but it's a natural marriage. And I think that's why in particular athletes are looking at early stage investments. Um, if we had sizable checks and you're looking with athletes that are now being LPs of larger private equity funds, then you can maybe de-risk your portfolio and invest in a later stage business. But I think because of social media and new tech, Athletes building scalable audiences that they can access authentically, and that being the missing piece for a lot of leveraged uh, startups, that's where we're seeing a lot of connection. I think the is, is absolutely amazing opportunity for athletes and for brands with social media, but it's also a very dangerous opportunity for athletes and their brands with social media. And we've seen so many great athletes crash and burn because they couldn't stop the Twitter fingers and because they couldn't post too much of their life and because they felt like sharing and being transparent, their true self was the best way to go, you know, would be just that, but it wasn't. It actually could ruin a 10, 15 year career like that. So it, it's very important to train these, get, these kids at a young age, even high school, because we're going back and looking at what you tweeted in high school. We're going back to see what you said when, when you were you know, a young, dumb kid. And if you have statements that are too strong, People will hold that against you and will mess with your money. Well, that's what's happening, though, right now. You have a lot of kids who I know in the basketball space who are 13, 14, 15 years old that have 450,000 people that follow them on Instagram. So I think right now, the more that we have informative conversations like this, these kids are understanding from a lot earlier of an age. Because Paul is, Paul is the end product of something that's great, right? It's the revolution. It's the revolution. Uh, it's, it's the way. It's the revolution of athletes in the way we think today. Yeah. And now, but I think when you have kids who are 12 years old that are seeing the business of their brand right. and seeing their brand yeah. being monetized and exposed and having access, it just gives you a different mindset at an earlier age. Yeah, I think that the one thing after you see how social media has affected the game and how fast that it has sped up the messaging of the teams and what happens with the team that coexists with the athlete. Athletes have to understand that the responsibility of social media is placed at the premium of the level that they're playing. And if they want to make it to the premium level, they have to understand that at a young age, they have to start at a premium level to telling stories. And that's one thing that as an athlete growing up in social media, 
you know, when I came out, I came out as Instagram started to trend. Everybody was still on Facebook. And as Instagram started to trend up, you see sponsors and you see the, t the right. inter intermingle of what, you know, what athletes want to say versus what they want to do. And, and they need to recognize that if you want to make it to this premium stage at a young age, that's exactly what the coaches, the owners, the front office, that everybody is paying so attention to. I get it, it's being responsible, but I do yes. wonder about, you guys know you have this incredible platform for being social agents of change. And I mean, Muhammad Ali, Ali did it, you know, Arthur Ashe. I mean, these are people who went out on a limb and, and through social media you can do it. And I do wonder, is that your responsibility to help push for those changes? It is, it is a responsibility. Um, just like I relate to personal experience, I was on the Eagles when we had the player coalition, dealing with specifically Colin Kaepernick and dealing with the, the things that happened with Eric Reed. It's a responsibility to properly ex explain and tell the true message that you know that will affect and provide the most positive light and what is actually really going on. There are so many things that change and evolve around the game of sports and in social media. As soon as you implement your message, it can have a ripple effect that goes throughout the entire sports and entertainment world. And as startups and different companies get involved in it and people are starting to express, express themselves and they're starting to involve themselves in different type of technologies and, and able to tell these more fluid stories, they need to understand that the fans are able to access them and they're able to interpret these things in a way fluid manner and, and, and able to interpret them and actually use them against them or for them, so. I, I think one aspect that sometimes becomes missed is the opportunity of collaboration. So the way I would look at something is if I wanted to make a statement, since there is that one degree of separation with the likes of venture capitalists or a Baba or guys like that, reaching out to those individuals and saying, let's talk through the pros and cons of what I want my statement to be. What effect does this have on an entity I currently work for? And I would want the same from my employees. Hey, if there's something that you want to make, okay, let's talk about what the repercussions of those actions could be. But I think collaboration is something that we need to start having more conversations about instead of just, I think sometimes the social media becomes knee jerk. I have, to, I have to do this right now in front of everybody, make my statement without even thinking about what your statement is going to be. Right. Um, and understanding with the words that you Think say. a little bit. I mean, look, I, I had, in real time, I had to process a guy that was a mentor to me passing away. It was raw, it was very emotional for me. I cursed on TV. You're talking about Kobe. Yes, I cursed on TV. Walking away from that experience, being emotional, I wonder what it would have been like, and I understand that everybody else appreciated that raw emotion, but I also have a wife and I have a child. That is my livelihood. And I have to think as soon as I walked off that set, my job is in jeopardy because of what I did, to a degree. Um, it comes along with the territory. That's part of the responsibility as well. Um, we've only got a couple more minutes, and I just wanted to wrap up. Um, if you could, I know I hate these kind of questions, but you guys are a pretty amazing group up here. If you could sit down with one person right now, talk to them about your business, pick their brains, just briefly, who would it be and why? <laughs> I only got two minutes and 15 seconds. On, Jay. Jay, go ahead. Are you put me on the spot? I am. I um, actually got a chance to spend some time with him. He's one of the, the backers of Paul's company, Joe and Clara Sai. I Just think, uh, yeah, I think. Alibaba. Yeah, seeing how they manage Alibaba, seeing how they originated that, how they've scaled that business to the degree what the future of that vertical is for them. Uh, I, I find it so intriguing because you talk about social responsibility. Right. Yes. Um, Perfect person to talk to. And that becomes a challenge. Paul, you're next. You gotta be quick. So <laughs> one, uh, one person, uh, I could probably list off a dozen. <laughs> I know you could. Um, <laughs> Pick one. So I, 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 would, I would say alive. I would say Bob Iger. I, I haven't had a chance to meet Mr. Iger, uh, but I think the complexity of the Walt Disney business from events to media, uh, it, it probably mirrors the way we think about the PLL. Uh, we think about us as a media company that lacrosse is the vehicle of which we're building and the livelihood of our players. Uh, but how do we distribute that product? And, Walt Disney Company's done a terrific job.
great at integrating so many platforms. 20 seconds, 25 seconds. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> the pressure. Yeah. They eat up your time. I got right. an easy one. I can go. <laughs> yeah, quick, I would say... Um, you can share one. Someone similar to what I'm involved with, like a Steve Jobs in entertainment, uh, Jimmy Iovine or a Jay-Z. Because of how they scale, what they've been able to build, and how they're connect. And entertainment and sports is what we do. We're entertainers. You know, we're athletes, and we're involved in this sports tech. So the intertwine of those two, and like, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, The Defiant Ones, seeing how they built that conglomerate and able to satisfy with music, entertainment, and sports, and tech with Steve Jobs, that'd be. This is a great bunch of people. One uh, Mine's last easy. One. Uh, my former team owner, uh, Arthur Blank. The fact that he's been able to do so much in the sports space and in the business space and merge that together, it's been amazing uh, what he's accomplished. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, incredible panel, thank you. Thank and you. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.